on the road again, we find the elusive cash. And GPS Wars Part 2. Who will win? Who will lose? On Ice and Rise Geocaching Video Zine. Hi there, welcome to Ice and Rye's Geocaching Video Zine. I'm Ice and Rye, thanks for watching. If you're new to the family, welcome. Essentially what this show is, is me with my video camera, go out geocaching, film it, throw it together with a few hints, tips and tricks, upload it all into the internet so you can download and watch it to your own leisure. If you're a regular viewer, thanks for sticking around, appreciate your viewership. So what's new? Well, the big news, if you've been to my website, iceandride.com lately, is puppies. For the longest time, I've been looking for another Samoid, especially since I've uh, lost ice and rye. And my breeder friend in Calgary, Snowfire Sam's, had a litter back at the, uh, just right at the start of October. And they had four girls and two boys, and I've been on the list to get a female. This is going to be my new future agility and obedience dog, and a playmate for Abel. And if you're really interested, go to my website, iceandrye.com, and right there on the front page, and also on the left side menu bar, there's a link where you can tune in to the Snowfires Puppy Cam, and you can watch the little critters. They're growing like weeds. They're getting bigger every single day, and it's just a lot of fun to watch them and their mother. And their mother is Mercedes, who's actually the granddaughter of Rye. My guy. So these, this, this girl I'll be getting will actually be Rye's great granddaughter. Will be a member of the family. So I'm really looking forward to the new puppy coming into my household, and that should be coming in right around the start of uh, December. So watch out for. Let's see. This is the October episode. Watch out for episode 18. What else is new? Feeds. I received. Uh, I've received numerous emails from viewers saying, you know. I, iTunes is nice and everything, but I prefer watching either the DivX or the H.264 format. Could you set something up so that we don't have to go to the archive website and download? Well, I played around a little bit, and guess what? You asked, I answered. If you now go to my website, IceandRide.com, you will see on the right side now a series of feeds for, for, for this video podcast. And then there's the iTunes, which is still the big one, and there's also the new feeds for a high bandwidth H.264 format for you Mac fans and a high bandwidth DivX version for all you PC users out there. So you can get your Ice and Rice Geocaching video zine in multiple flavors with only one click. So check out my website. And the feeds are there. Help yourself. You're still using iTunes? Click on the iTunes feed. But if you use another uh, news aggregator such as uh, Fire Ant or iPod or X or Juice, you uh, feel free to use any format you like. But anyways, that's enough chatter now. Let's get in to geocaching news. So first in geocaching news, we have some major milestones. Three of my regular viewers reached the 500th find mark. And they are, from the Lower Mainland area, Mr. TJ, brother of TJ Guy, my tour guide when I'm down in the Lower Mainland. And the other two cachers are from the San Diego area, and they go by the name of Itrax and Foxtail. Now, the names themselves may not sound too familiar to you, but they're better known as Sunny and Sandy. You got it. The hosts of the Podcaster Podcast just found their 500th cache not too long ago, and I'm looking forward to hearing footage on their upcoming show. If you don't know what I'm talking about, 
Get with it, guys. Podcacher.com. It's a podcast all about geocaching. I do the video. They do the audio. It's a really great show. Make sure you check it out. But hey, guys, congratulations on 500 finds. I'm going to get there. Trust me, I am. So next to the news, we have notice of a couple geocaching events. The first event is the MIGO Fall Fun Day on October 14th. And then next, we have the BCGA meet and greet scheduled for November 4th. Now, the BCGA meet and greet is actually a province wide event, and there will be geocaching events held in various places throughout the province. And they have a couple in the lower mainland, and some on the island, and some out in the Kootenays. And unfortunately, myself, I won't be able to attend this year. I'll be at an agility trial that weekend. But if you're out and about, have fun and enjoy yourself. And if you'd like to find a geocaching event in your area, simply go to geocaching.com. Right on the front page, if you scroll about two thirds of the way down, you'll see a list of upcoming events. And they have an interactive calendar where you can click ahead and click on a particular day and it'll give you a list of events for that day. And I took a look and there's caching events all over the world. I actually was looking at one in Czechoslovakia, but can't get that weekend off, so I won't be able to attend. Next we hear from the BCGA website. YZF450 hatched a plan this week to take his girlfriend to Harrison Hot Springs for a few days of relaxation and a little geocaching. The last cache of the day was Proposal Point, where he made her find the cache and read the title of the logbook. As she was doing that, he pulled out the ring and proposed the question. She said yes. Well, congratulations, that's a heck of a way to go. <laughs> There's quite a few stories out there of geocaches popping the question with the use of the cache. And Proposal Point, well that's a special one. This was, that was the cache that was featured on the Dave Chalk Show that I happened to catch one Saturday morning. It actually got me into the sport of geocaching. So, the YZF 450, congratulations and all best wishes in the future. That about wraps it up for news. Let's get in to viewer's mail. So time for viewer's mail. If you'd like to send me an email, comment on the show, a geocaching story, or just any thoughts in general, send your email to geoisenry at isenry.com. So first we hear from Jonathan and he writes, I've just been watching episode 12 and in it you feature the five cent chocolate war and say that Smarties are a Canada only treat. I don't know if anyone else in the UK has contacted you, but you'll be pleased to know that Smarties are alive and well in the UK. They change colors over the year as worries about coloring and additives come and go, but they're still to be found in their tubes with a plastic lid which has a letter of the alphabet molded on it. Do they do that in Canada too? Love the video zines, keep up the good work, Jonathan. Well, thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, I did hear once upon a time that Smarties were available in other countries, and allegedly the actual chocolate has uh, different formulas. A friend of mine is a um, avid vegan, not just vegetarian, but avoids uh, milks and egg products, and he's a big fan of Smarties. He actually has to import them from, supposedly, the UK because they use a different form of chocolate, whereas here in Canada we use traditional milk chocolate. As for the containers, no, we just use good old-fashioned cardboard boxes but way back when, when the cardboard boxes used to be empty, we used to tear off the ends, we could blow through them and it sounded like a kazoo and we had a great time driving our parents crazy. So next we hear from Treasure Humper and he writes, Hi Ice and Rye, enjoyed your latest episode, especially the footage of Dave Ulmer, placer of the original stash. Here in Nova Scotia, we are lucky enough to have placed the first cache in Canada, which was placed by local cacher East River. Recently there was a plaque placed celebrating the 6th anniversary of the cache placement. It was designed and made by a geocacher. A coin was designed and minted to raise money for this effort. I've not been able to get to it, but yet it remains number one on my to-do list. Oh, thank you. I've, uh, I actually have the Atlantic geocaching coin myself, and it's quite a nice piece. And as a matter of fact, stay tuned for future episodes of Vice and Rice Geocaching Video Zing, because I'm putting together a very special cache, and um, the coin might be one of the ingredients, but uh, I'll have more information on that in an upcoming episode. Anyways, that wraps it up. For viewers' mail, let's get into Frat Per Map shoutouts. Fra 
Proper maps. If you don't know what they are, essentially it's a good old fashioned wall map that you used to put up in your room and you used to stick in pins of all the different places you've been. Well in this case it's a virtual map on the internet where people place pins where they live and the people are viewers of the show. If you're not a member of the Frapper Map yet, visit my website eisenright.com and look for the Frapper Map logo on the right side and add your pin to the map. Anyways, this month the shout outs go to Mr. Ski. Dennis Thompson, Gary Road, Henry Durant, an old time radio addict. So folks, thanks for joining my Frapper Map, and again, if you'd like to join, just visit my website and just look for the icon on the right side of the menu bar. Well anyways, as they say in boxing, that wraps up the preliminaries, let's get on with the main events. Cash maintenance, necessary part of the sport. Don't know what that is? Well, if you're a cash placer, it is up to you to maintain your cash. It is up to you, it is your responsibility to make sure that the cash stays safe, that it's findable, that it's well stocked, and that the thing actually exists. And it's part of your responsibility to every now and then actually go out and check on your own caches to make sure that they meet, still meet all the criteria. And a lot of times the trigger for a trip to one of your own caches is when you start seeing a fair number of did not find logs. Well, in my case, I decided I was going to check on uh, one of my own caches, the road to UMBC. Now you might remember back in episode 9, I wanted to show it to you for winter caching and unfortunately with the snowpack and everything, I couldn't get to it. So a few weeks ago, just at the start of fall when the leaves were changing, changing colors, I decided to go and check on it. Because there's a few things I wanted to make sure the cache was indeed okay and I had a new camera that I wanted to add to the cache. Now, just before we get in, get into the episode, I just want to show you a demonstration just how important cache maintenance is. One of my caches here in Prince George is called Unchain My Cache and it hasn't been found in well over a month and it's in a very high traffic area and it's easy to get to. Well I decided to go on check on it, check on it today on the way to this taping site and unfortunately this is all I found from the cache. Without giving away too much you pretty much figure out what that was and that's all I was left of the cache container so obviously it's gone. So when I get home from this taping, I'm going to have to archive the cache. But I love the idea and I am going to do it again. I'll just have to pick a better location for this cache. But anyways, let's go check out the road to UNBC. So some of you might remember back in episode, I believe it was 10, and I did a little brief article on winter caching. And the cache I used to demonstrate was one of my own. It was called the road to UNBC. Now, if we go back and watch that episode, you'll remember that I didn't find it, which is embarrassing. It's my own darn cache, and I couldn't find it. Well, a couple months later, when spring finally came around, people started finding the cache again, and it turns out what it was is what I speculated in the show is that it was buried under a foot of ice. We had uh, several freeze and thaw, or thaw and freeze cycles throughout that winter. And I dug down to where the cache was. Unfortunately, I couldn't penetrate the ice. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. So, here it is. It's now September in the central interior, and it's fall. And as you can tell, the leaves are all changing colors. And uh, guess what? We're back on the road to UMBC again. We're going to go down, check out the cache, and make sure that's doing fine. And basically, I want to turn this into a little segment on cache maintenance. So one thing that's often overlooked is you, the cache owner, have to be responsible for your caches. And part of that responsibility, of course, is making sure the cache is still there and checking on it every now and then to make sure the cache is still in good shape and that everything is fine. So this cache hasn't been found a lot this year. Most of the Prince George area caches found it the first year it was out, and this is a year three for this cache. And it's sort of in an out-of-way place, so a lot of tourists who come through town uh, generally don't get up to here. So there aren't some new caches in town, it's fall. We always find that in the spring, in the fall, we get a lot of new people involved in the sport. And right behind me is the university, and we get a lot of people in there who get into the sport. So hopefully this fall will be found more often. Now, what I'm basically going to do again is I'm just going to go back, make sure the cache is there, and finally show you the world what this darn thing looks like. And I'm just going to check on the ingredients, make sure everything's doing fine, and I have a new camera I'm going to add to the cache. That was one of the more fun features of this cache, so it was my first. And I figured I'd put in a little disposable camera. People take pictures of themselves at the cache site, and I had the pictures developed, 
and they're up on my Flickr site. I'll post a link on my website, and of course, by now you'll be looking at it in the little graphic spot on the bottom of the screen. And uh, it's really neat to be able to put some uh, faces to some of the names of uh, people who found this cache. So anyways, I'm just looking down the road here, and I see we're getting close to where the clearing is, as a matter of fact. Well, we're running to one of the classic problems of this cache is uh, I'm in an extremely treed area and uh, lost my signal. So it's a little hard to find, but we shall see what happens. Let's go down the road a little further here and I'll check back in with you when I get there. Okay, well, the skies must have opened up or something because uh, as you can see, we now have a signal and we're about five meters away from the cache. And as a matter of fact, it's just over here. And uh, see, we've developed a nice little trail going in here. So, uh, interesting. We'll have to see where this trail leads. Anyways, time to go into the woods. Next time you see me, hopefully I'll have the cash. So how does the rest of the segment go? Just stay tuned and you'll find out. But for now, we're going to go on a slight detour. You may also remember from episode 9, I did GPS Wars Part 1 and Part 1.5. So this episode, you finally get to see GPS Wars Part 2. So here we go. Sit back, relax, place your bets, and enjoy. So just east of French George, just off the highway, as a matter of fact, you'll hear highway noise in the background, there's this giant concrete pillar behind me. So what's so significant about this chunk of concrete? Well, it's part of the Canadian Base Network, a series of pillars that mark exact geographical locations. Why is this important? Well, because you can go to the government website and download the exact coordinates of this pillar. And why would you want to know that? GPS Wars Part 2. I've entered the coordinates for this pillar into both my old Magellan and my Garmin. And if you're interested, the pillar is officially known as B669770 and its coordinates which I'll give in UTM format taken with the NAD83 system are zone 10 north 5973743.57 meters by east 543331.07 meters the elevation 775.238 meters now if you're asking why am I giving the coordinates in UTM and using the old uh, NAD83 system is because, well, first off, that's how they're listed on the website. And secondly, it's the most common format between my old, my old GPS receiver and my new receiver. I've gone and set it from the WG84 system to the NAC or NAG or whatever they're calling it this week. <laughs> and um, I've entered the coordinates as an UTM. Now, obviously, my GPS receivers aren't going to be as accurate as these coordinates list, but hopefully we can get relatively close. Now, for the last 20 minutes or so, the units have actually been sitting on top of the pier, and they've been averaging. So we're just go basically going to go over and take a look at them and see, how they, see what they say. So first we'll do the Garmin. Picking up the Garmin, and well, as you can see, it's saying that we're about four meters away from the waypoint. Three meters away from the waypoint. Fairly decent. I mean, the coordinates, this thing can only get within two or three meters, so if it's saying that we're within three meters, it's pretty darn close. The Magellan. It's having a bad day. I'm not exactly sure what was going on, but when I fired it up and used the uh, go-to feature, it immediately snapped the four meters. I was like, okay, that's cool. They're both reading fairly close. Well, I then put it on top of the pier and let it sit, and well, I can see the results. Let me make sure you can see the reflection. Yeah, I'm 71 kilometers away from it, and I'm traveling at 442 kilometers an hour. So. I don't know what's going on with my Bajellan. It's been sitting on the counter for a while, and I think it's kind of losing its brains. But, you know, if, if you're a GPS, if you're a Magellan expert, email me. I'd really like to know what's going on with this unit and why I'm getting such wonky numbers. It just seems unusual for this unit. So anyways, well, let's just put this back. So while I'm here, I'll also be taking pictures of this pier, and I'll be submitting it to uh, thewaymarking.com 
website. It uh, used to be a, um, a locationless cache called uh, Canadian Base Network where they there's 150 some odd number of these all across the can all across the Canada and you got to go and register them as a find and as we all know locationless caches are now gone and it's all gone the way marking and there is a way marking category for Canadian benchmarks and this one hasn't been entered yet so I'll be able to go home and upload the pictures and the coordinates and everything and and put all the data from the website and it'll be a way mark and again, I know a lot of people out there aren't exactly uh, thrilled about waymarking, you know. Really, who cares where there's a McDonald's or a bowling alley? However, the way I feel about waymarking is that if it gets you out there and using your GPS receiver and learning new ways of taking marks and, you know, you're learning how to use this piece of equipment. So in that case, they're very good. I mean, granite really... Who wants to bookmark all the McDonald's? But something as important as this, this is a very important piece of equipment. And it's a great way to test the accuracy of your GPS receiver. Now, I'm going to go reboot the Magellan and see if I can come up with something different, but I really don't know why it's uh, going so wonky. So I have to say that round one was a. Um, round one was void. Round 1.5 was a tie. Round two got to give it to the Garmin. So all you Magellan folks out there, sorry guys, your unit's down uh, one to nothing, but like I said, if you have any idea what's going on with this unit, email me, I'd really like to know. So there you go, round two GPS warts thrown in with a little bit of way marking. Hope you enjoyed. So all you Magellan fans out there will be pleased to know that about half an hour after I finished filming that segment, the Magellan finally started working properly and it was giving me good readings. Unfortunately by then I would already left the poll site, but however in a few weeks I'll go back and try this whole experiment again and see how it turns out. But anyways, you've been waiting, let's get back to the road to UNBC and see how it turns out. You know, I'm really lucky I don't work with a film crew because what you haven't seen is for the last probably half an hour to 45 minutes, I've been thrashing around in the woods here trying to find my own cache, believe it or not. Signal reception in here is, well, between non-existent and zero. And I was thrashing and looking. Because what I did when I originally set up the cache is I actually left a little marker on a tree. It's just a little tiny piece of red ribbon, actually, a leftover balloon that I left on the tree to remind myself where it was. And the cache would be within one meter of that location. Well, holy cow, I looked and looked and looked and looked and looked. And the GPS was taking me all over the place. And then I figured, you know, I just better sit down and, and just wait. So I actually went back out to the roads where it was a little bit clear let the GPS get a bit of a signal, sort of pointed me off in a direction saying that's sort of that way and basically walked in a straight line and lo and behold I finally found the cache. It's actually hiding behind me and once I turn around I hope I can find it again. And the strange thing is we look at the GPS it's telling me I'm three meters away from the cache which I'm actually three meters away from the cache. So I don't know how this sucker pulled this off. But Normally, I don't really trust my GPS that much because they all have built in inaccuracies. And if I just bring up the proper page, let me just punch the button. So, there's the one. There's my reception. All right, so here it is the road to UNBC, my very first cache. So, we start off like all good caches the logbook, my uh, geocaching note. And somewhere sit my knee, here we go. The swag bag. Go back down a bit so you don't see the sunny reflection. Quite a variety of goods in here. Oh my. This is one of the original ingredients of this cache. I placed a series of gold medals in here to give away as first to find prizes and uh, there's still some left in here. Holy cow. Here we go, micro cache container. There are these trading cards. There's some, still some of the original balloons in there. Wow. Cash is three years old and some of the original items are still in there. The container itself, here in Canada, we're fairly uh, popular. These containers are called lock and locks. Similar to Tupperware, so they have a, a clip on cover instead of a snap on. And this is the lid here. And they're very good, very waterproof, extremely durable. 
Now this particular cache I keep in a, in a uh, paper, uh, sorry, a plastic bag. That's its waterproof protection there. So it's just an extra layer of water protection. And since it's inside the bag, it doesn't need to be camouflaged. But anyways, if I reach into my pocket here, it's off shot. It's pink, but it's the new disposable camera that'll be going into the cache. I'll just simply place it inside the bag with the logbook. So then when you come to the cache location, you can simply take the camera, push the button, click, and take a picture. Getting back to cache maintenance, as you can see, everything's in very decent shape. I use the Ziploc freezer bags. And they're good, strong, tough, durable bags, and all the contents seem fine and dry. The container itself is a little moist, but because it's a lock and lock, it keeps everything fairly dry. So anyways, I'm here. We're going to put the camera in, rehide this cache, and we'll be off and running. So there you go, proof that the road to UNBC truly exists. It is a bit of a difficult cache to find with all the leaf coverage in the area, but it was my first cache and it's a lot of fun to go after. And the area around there, there's trails and scenery and it's a really great area. And it's a nice little pathway between the lower bowl area of Prince George and the university, which is above where I'm standing. So just before I go, a few closing remarks. It's uh, sort of a new month now, and I haven't mentioned it in a while, but Ice and Rice Geocaching Video Zine is listed with the uh, Podcast Alley service. And if you could be so kind, run over to the website, give me a vote, and it's basically a popularity contest is all it is. But what it does is gives the show a bit more exposure and gets a few more people to watching it, and hopefully we can get a few more people into this great sport. So, in the meantime, and in between time, that's it. Another episode of Ice and Rice Geocaching Video Zine. So until the next episode, cash on. I'm just gonna let some cars go by. Zoom, zoom, zoom. It's like a bad mess, the commercial. Now she's a Toyota. And next, for my own province of British Columbia, we have the BCGA meet and greet, November 4th, 2006. And if you wanna find any, any events, any, 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 maps, maps. Okay, yeah, there's lots of traffic going by. Things will be pretty difficult to do this without having at least one or two cars go by. I mean, after all, I am standing on the side of a highway. Now, you may be wondering, what's this concrete thing standing behind me? Well, it's part of the uh, Canadian Geographical Society. What do they call it? The Canadian Base Network. And the uh, piece of concrete has a nickname. It's called Pier 6. And officially, according to the government, is known as B669770, Pier 6, established by the BC Ministry of Environment. And its provincial identifier is known as 669770. And if you have Aussie Explorer and you want to bring up a, a topographical map from uh, the Canadian Geographical Service, it's on map 093G16. So, what's so particular about this pier behind me? Well, it, on the internet, it has exact coordinates, and that sucks. So, if you remember from episode 9, uh, one thing led to another, and I never really did get around to doing what I wanted to do. And so, as I said, part 1 was void, and part 1.5 was actually a tie. So, for part 2, I decided to go somewhere where it would probably determine a winner, if not, at least give me an idea of how accurate these uh, GPS receivers were because the place I would be, I would know its exact measurement. And there's um, a series of posts just east of town and one of them is actually a post that belongs to the Canadian Geographical Society and it's actually marked down, if you check the website, it's actually marked down to 
about the, the millimeter. It's a very, very fine, minute adjustment. And years ago, it used to be a virtual cache, and now it's part of the waymarking category. And this is just babbling on too much.